Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Heather Logan, Senior Advisor, Pharmaceutical Reviews at CADF. Thank you for joining us for the first in a series of webinars CADF is hosting on topics related to COVID-19. For those of you who are, aren't familiar with CADF, uh, we are an independent not-for-profit organization that provides uh, Canada's healthcare decision makers with objective evidence to help them make informed decisions about the optimal use of drugs, medical devices, uh, clinical interventions, and procedures across our healthcare system. Since the start of COVID-19 pandemic, we've prioritized at CADA supporting decision makers, clinicians, and the healthcare system during this unprecedented and challenging time, while maintaining a focus on much of our core work. To date, we've released more than 100 reports providing evidence in the areas of prevention, infection control, screening and testing, diagnosis, treatment, and mental health. Uh, recently, pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure treatment with a group of drugs called antivirals, sometimes in combinations with an antibiotic, have been the subject of public debate and at times significant media reporting. Two possible candidates, in particular hydrochloroquine and remdesivir, are getting a lot of hype. One of the world's leaders, in fact, has publicly stated he's taking hydrochloroquine and when asked what the evidence is for its effectiveness, responded with, I get a lot of calls about it and they're positive. So wanting treatments to be effective in the treatment of COVID-19 is not the same as evidence to demonstrate that they are, in fact, effective. In today's webinar, two speakers will provide an overview of the evidence for these drug treatments and talk about whether the evidence supports the hype. Our first speaker is Dr. Terry Ahuja, the Manager of Program Development for Pharmaceutical Reviews at CADA. He's also worked as a Senior Market Real World Evidence Synth Scientist for Europe and Canada for Eli Lilly, a pharmaceutical company. Terry has a PhD in Neuroscience with a specialty in Electrophysiology and Pharmacology. He lectures at Carleton University on the Biological Foundations of Addictions and on Health Psychology. Our second speaker probably needs no introduction, Dr. Gordon Guyot, a distinguished press professor at McMaster University. He coined the term, in fact, evidence-based medicine in 1990 and has since advocated for evidence-based approaches to medical decision-making in a variety of settings. He's published more than 1,200 papers in peer-reviewed journals cited by more, more than 135,000 times. I had to read that twice, but that's true. In fact, he is one of the world's 20 most cited scientists. Recently, he led a practice guidelines regarding COVID-19 treatment and three associated systematic reviews that were published in the Journal of the Canadian Medical Association. There are speakers today. So about our format, we'll hold questions until after both of our speakers have concluded. We have turned off the chat function and put everyone on mute. So don't worry about background noise, background noise. Um, but you can submit your questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A tab in the Zoom control bar. If you have any technical issues, please use the Q&A tab to let us know, and CADA's fabulous events team will try to resolve them for you. So now let's look at the evidence, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Terry. Thanks, Heather. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Actually, good afternoon. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us on this webinar. Um, I know it's a really challenging time, a unique time. Uh, so we thought, you know, we use this forum to be able to educate you about some of the stuff about what's happening. So uh, today's uh, talk is titled, Does the Evidence Support the Hype? And, you know, I, I'm, my, the, my disclaimer is here, we're not going to really be able to get deep into all of the data just because of time constraints, but I'm going to be leaning heavily on some reports that we have up on our COVID, CAT of COVID website. So obviously feel free to go there afterwards uh, or during if you'd like to um, download those reports to get a better sense. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, right now, what's really, really happening is a lot of hype. Uh, next slide, please. So if we, if we listen to the news, if you look around, uh, whether it's social media, the TV, we're inundated with hype. Um, and everybody is kind of hoping for and, and reaching for and touting a potential silver bullet, something that will solve all of our COVID problems. Now, the problem with the hype is hype usually comes out pretty quickly. A lot of people who are not vetted uh, or really positioned to be saying the right things around, around medicines are speaking. Uh, and a lot of folks listen, uh, and that can create problems. Um, I know firsthand, uh, my elderly mother calls me on a weekly basis and she says, you know, Teddy, they found a cure. I'm like, mom, I'm pretty sure they don't have a cure. Where did you hear this? Oh, I saw it on the Facebook. And I'm like, mom, I, I don't know if that's actually been vetted. We should probably look at the evidence. The problem is the evidence takes time. Uh, next, click please. Um, and that usually looks a little something um, like this. Uh, an elderly statesman scientist who takes his time, 
does the details and provides the evidence, the evidence that we need to really either confirm or negate the hype. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, let's take a look at the current landscape. So COVID-19 is the culprit, is the issue at hand. And from here, we really have two options. Next slide, please. Um, so the first option that we have uh, is looking at prevention. And so we have a lot of the things that we can follow that we hear in the news that we've been instructed to do, which is uh, health policy. So things like physical distancing. Uh, next slide. Uh, next click, sorry, actually. Um, the other pathway that we have is treatment. In the treatment pathway, we have a couple of things that we're going to talk about today. And these are some things that have bubbled to the top. Next slide. So um, we have chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, and we also have remdesivir. And we're going to be focusing, I'm going to be honing in on those two agents because they've received probably the lion's share of the spotlight and the hype. Um, I have a nice great other box, which contains a lot. It really doesn't do it justice. There's a lot going on there. And I know uh, Gordon's going to be mentioning a little bit about that, but I'm going to really focus in on, on those antivirals uh, that we have outlined here. Next slide, please. So let's get into chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin. Next slide, please. So uh, some of the Petri dish data in, in vitro data showed that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine um, were able to inhibit uh, coronaviridae, which is, a, uh, which is a broader term for some agents, which includes SARS and COVID-19. Um, next, please. Uh, some of the clinical trials combined chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine with this antibacterial agent, azithromycin, and that combo has been used for the treatment of malaria in certain places. Um, hydroxychloroquine can be used for other conditions as well, like rheumatoid arthritis and, and symptoms of lupus as well. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we're going to get into some of the data that was posted uh, recently on our CADF uh, COVID site, uh, an original report outlining some of the evidence for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And first up was a, a Chinese randomized pilot study that was conducted in non-severe patients by Chen. And the study here gave patients hydroxychloroquine for five days plus standard of care. And what they thought, saw was no real differences in virologic cure, and, and that was after about seven days of treatment. And there's really no significant differences in safety measures, and, and those weren't really clearly outlined. Next slide, please. This was followed up by a second Chinese randomized study, which was conducted by Chen Z, so a different Chen, uh, where patients received hydroxychloroquine for five days. And here we started to see some improvement. So they noticed some benefit in body temperature recovery time, cough remission, uh, and just the imaging of pneumonia. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the next study that really started to garner some attention was a study out of France. And this was an open label, non-randomized trial conducted uh, on confirmed COVID patients. Now, this is a small study. This is a small sort of caveat here is that it was 42 patients enrolled, but only 36 were included in the analysis. Um, hydroxychloroquine showed a reduction in the viral load in the active group, uh, but safety, uh, safety outcomes and adverse events were really not reported. Now, there's a lot of limitations with the study, and I'm not going to get into all of them, but you know, things like there was no comparator or placebo, and just how a lot of it was conducted in, in terms of what was included and not included in the study really kind of create some limitations here. But this study did show some flags of some potential benefit, but the risk was unclear. They went in and did an extension study with 80 patients that also showed benefits with very few adverse events. Um, and there was no control group again in this, in this um, study. Next slide, please. Now, Health Canada has recently approved two studies assessing the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine, uh, and they're outlined here in this table. I apologize for this it's kind of small font, but you can read it in the full report. Uh, and it also, uh, another Canadian trial, which is the Alberta HOPE COVID-19 trial, and it's looking at severe COVID-19 patients as well. More to come about that in a, in a few slides. Um, next slide, please. Now, um, since we published a report, and this is a great indication of just how quickly this evidence is being generated, and, and it's the Wild West, to be honest with you, daily, we're keeping an eye on what's happening. Um, just recently, a whole bunch of new evidence came out. At least 13 new studies were published since our first CADIS report. So we have an updated report going up today, actually, if it's not already up. Um, and this new slew of studies included one from France uh, by Mahavis, uh, and in that study, eight out of 84 patients dropped out of the study due to electrocardiogram changes. So now we're starting to see potentially some risk. So we're seeing some safety signals related to cardiovascular issues. 
on May 22nd, which is just last Friday, uh, a multinational registry analysis found um, absence of the therapeutic benefit and potential harm. And the study was published in the Lancet, and this was a really large uh, sort of uh, registry analysis that had 96,000 patients. So fairly robust. Now, as a result of that, on May 25th, the World Health Organization decided to temporarily suspend their hydroxychloroquine arm of their solidarity trial. This is a trial that has 3,500 patients in 17 countries uh, and has a, a variety of other arms. So there's three other arms with other experimental drugs that are, that are gonna continue, but they're halting the hydroxychloroquine arm of their trial. And on May 28th, this Alberta HOPE trial that I had already mentioned, which aimed to recruit about 1,600 patients, currently only had about 150 outpatients, has also halted. So now we're starting to see that there's clearly uh, some issues with this agent in terms of potential risk. Next slide. So it brings this question, does the evidence support the hype? And I think for this agent, the answer is no. The, uh, the evidence really doesn't support the benefit that was illustrated by the early Chinese studies and those initially coming out of France. Initially, there was no safety signals that we were concerned about, and the latter studies did not show the positive clinical benefit that the first earlier ones did and started to show some of these potential CV issues. Um, the issues that we're concerned about here are the, uh, the potential to prolong QT, QTC interval, which may be uh, linked to an increased risk in arrhythmias. So, so a fairly significant concern to be worried about. Um, so let's move on to our next agent. The next uh, agent which is garnering a lot of attention is remdesivir. So remdesivir was originally developed as a treatment for hepatitis C, um, and then as a treatment for Ebola and Marburg virus diseases. So uh, this, this drug showed good activity against SARS and MERS viruses uh, in, in vitro, so within dishes and also within animal studies. And so I think there's a clear linkage as to potentially why we should try this. Um, next slide. This drug, because of some of the early data, has actually garnered uh, some regulatory status. So in Canada, we have not approved this drug, but in, in the US, the US FDA has actually approved it under its emergency use authorization program. And that happened at the top of the month. Um, UK's uh, NHS also made it available under their early access to medicine scheme, and that was just this week. And Japan approved this agent earlier in May as well. So you can see a couple of countries have already made this available in select situations. Uh, next slide. So I'm presenting this table and this is borrowed from our CADIS report, which is posted on the site. And it's just highlighting really the main nuggets of information that we really wanna focus in on. Um, so we'll focus, we'll go through the completed trials first and then I'm gonna just mention some of the ongoing trials as we finish up. So next slide, please. Um, so the first study to really come out and make some noise was the study by Wang et al. in Lancet. Uh, this was um, published in Lancet, and this is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. It was a multi-center, 10-hospital study in the city of Wuhan, one of the initial epicenters uh, where COVID really started to surface. Uh, and they looked at laboratory-confirmed uh, laboratory cases of COVID. Now, this is really a good news, bad news story. Um, the good news is, that they actually stopped the trial because there was a good control of the pandemic in their country and they really weren't able to get enough patients anymore and so they stopped. So the initial trial sample size was over 450 patients but the trial stopped early and they were only able to randomize 237 patients, so only getting about half of what they intended. Uh, they saw no significant differences for any effectiveness measure including mortality, number of days in hospital, or time to clinical improvement. And there was no concerning safety signals. So um, the bad news was, uh, that they weren't actually able to finish the study and weren't able to see the true full picture of what was happening. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide, the next study really that uh, also garnered a lot of attention uh, was the ACT trial, so the Adaptive COVID-19 Treatment Trial. Uh, and this was published, recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was uh, sponsored by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. So here's another multi-center uh, study, 100 sites globally in 10 countries, uh, nothing in Canada, but a lot of other spots, with a total sample size of over 1,000 patients, and 89% of the patients had severe COVID. Now, this trial also ended early, um, and it ended at the interim analysis, but the data well, that, was, that was made available through an FDA um, fact sheet showed potential for reduced recovery time from 11 days for remdesivir patients to 15 days for those on, on placebo. Um, there was no difference in mortality rates at 14 days, and we're still waiting for the 28-day data. 
the serious, serious adverse events were prevalent in the placebo group. Now, interesting that this data actually was made uh, available officially through the preliminary results just recently, only a few days ago. And the original hype that had been created came from an earlier look of the data that for the FDA. Um, it was now legitimized through this most recent publication. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we can look at an ongoing trial that's looking at another question, and that's looking at five days versus 10 days. And that if you give five days of treatment of remdesivir, is that as good uh, or is 10 days better? And this was just released on Wednesday. So this is how fresh the data is coming out that quick. Um, and in this study, there was 402 patients. Uh, this study is funded by Gilead Sciences, so the manufacturer of the actual drug. And they found no difference between five and 10 days. Um, so no real benefit in ex ex extending the course. So it gets us to, does the evidence support the hype? In this case, it's not a flat out no, but I would go with not really, because the evidence does show some modest clinical benefit, but there's uh, more evidence that's needed to come out. Uh, currently, the studies do not show any safety concerns, but researchers are keeping an eye on some potential markers for hepatic issues. And so further evidence generation will really be important to shed more light. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just to summarize, I would say that neither of these drug regimes has really produced that silver bullet that everybody is sort of hoping for. It's, it's lacked, it's, it's been able to show the clinical evidence to support all of this hype. Um, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine have a higher, risk, uh, a higher risk and lower benefit ratio with some potential CV risk. And remdesivir shows some modest improvement of time to recovery from 11 to 15 days for patients that are hospitalized uh, and there is no real safety issue just yet. Uh, and one last thing I'll leave with is all of this information is based on patients who are either going through clinical trials or are hospitalized in an incident control environment. So none of this is really for the general public just yet. So um, I will leave it at that. And that is just my summary, a uh, high level summary of these two agents that have been really, really hyped up and, and a brief glimpse into some of the evidence that we currently have available. Great, thank you very much, Terry. And just a reminder for all of you, we'll hold questions until after uh, Dr. Guide has finished his presentation. And, and I, our apologies for the mismatch between the presentation and the content on the slides. Uh, so Dr. Guide, I'll hand it over to you. Dr. Guide, I think you are on mute. Thank you. I was indeed on mute. Thank you for pointing it out. So starting off with disclosures, um, the uh, financially non-relevant to this presentation, I'm co-chair of the great working group, and you'll find out why that's a potential intellectual conflict. And I was an author on the recent guidelines and systematic reviews that I'm going to talk about. Next. So the agenda for this talk is first to talk about some standards for evidence and recommendations, challenges in assessing COVID-19 treatments, recent systematic reviews and guidelines that we produced, and then forthcoming systematic reviews and guidelines. Next. So there is a group called the GRADE Working Group that has developed a system for rating quality of evidence and moving from evidence to recommendations. Um, I feel fairly comfortable telling you about this because over 110 groups worldwide have endorsed the particular system, including leading groups like the World Health Organization, Cochrane Collaboration, and for clinicians up to date. So the way this system of the certainty or quality of evidence works, randomized trials start as high quality evidence but they may not end up as high quality evidence. They may be rated down for risk of bias, lack of blinding, loss to follow up, inconsistency of results between studies, indirectness, uh, we're interested in uh, severe COVID-19 and studies were done in less severe, for instance, imprecision from small sample sizes and worries about publication bias. So randomized trials start high, but may end up as moderate, low, or even very low if there's big problems. Observational studies, on the other hand, start as low quality evidence in this high, moderate, low, and very low scheme, but um, they could be rated up, particularly if they're large or very large effects. Next. So 
what are the challenges in assessing treatments for COVID-19? It's a complex illness and one could be uh, thinking of intervening at very sta various stages in the prevention of the illness, when in people with mild illness, people with serious illness, and people with critically ill. There are multiple treatments available. You've already heard about two of them. Um, as it turns out, they can be given individually or together. And there's already at least one randomized trial compare three of the drugs to one of the drugs. Um, currently, there is still not a lot of evidence. Lots of low quality evidence, but very little high quality. Um, and with respect to remdesivir, um, that where there's perhaps better evidence than anywhere else, it's still preliminary, as you've heard. Um, there are challenges with the rapidity with treatments are changing. Many randomized trials go on, uh, are ongoing. And there are challenges with respect to what the audience faces. There are lots of people doing summaries um, of the uh, evidence. I'll talk about that a little more. And there's lots of people producing guidelines. Next. Next. Okay. So um, if you were looking for a trustworthy guideline, what would you look for? <coughs> Excuse me. You'd look for a guideline based on high quality systematic reviews of the best evidence, including benefits and harms against placebo or against another comparator. You would be looking for a guideline that constituted an appropriate panel, content, people who've done research in the area, people who are experts on various aspects of COVID-19, frontline clinicians with a lot of experience dealing with the patients and thus knowledge of the practical issues, patient partners who can inform us among other things about what's important to them and their values and preferences, and methodologists, people like me who might help to interpret the evidence. Nowadays, an ideal guideline panel will attend to both gender, gender and geographic balance. For instance, World Health Organization, uh, COVID-19 worldwide problem, uh, likes geographic balance, appropriately so. You would like a panel that has minimized conflict of interest and that has a uh, formal, a rigorous process in moving from evidence to recommendations that considers not only benefits and harms, but also values and preferences, which I will lead to again, and makes it clear recommendations can be strong, just do it recommendations, or weak, it depends recommendations, and an ideal system would tell you that. Next. Okay, so uh, this uh, moves now to what we did. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we published in the CMAJ a guideline about COVID that addressed three sets of treatments, steroids in patients with uh, respiratory, severe respiratory disease, uh, or just serious uh, but not critical um, uh, COVID, convalescent plasma, and a whole set of antiviral drugs that you see listed here. Um, big changes of the uh, drugs that we looked at are in hydroxychloroquine. You've heard about that. The evidence hasn't changed much yet for any of the others that we looked at. Next. So we found suboptimal evidence, and so we had to rely on the best evidence, but it wasn't very good. Some of the agents had not been tested at all or minimally in COVID, so we had to look at other uh, uh, coronaviruses, SARS and MERS and Ebola, and even at influenza. Um, we had randomized trials in ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome, and in community acquired pneumonia. Nice to have randomized trials, but they weren't in COVID patients, so you have problems with indirectness. Um, of mostly when they were in COVID, observational studies are very small randomized trials. At best, low quality evidence of benefit, most very low quality evidence of benefit. Uh, so really great uncertainty. Next slide. So these are how um, grade suggests presenting the summaries of the evidence. Um, and what you can see here, this is for ribavirin. 
in severe COVID-19, but there were no studies in COVID-19, so we had to look at observational studies in SARS and MERS, other coronaviruses, to provide indirect evidence about ribavirin. And we found evidence that bared on only three outcomes, mortality and adverse effects of anemia and bradycardia. Next click. So for instance, what, do these kind, what does this kind of figure tell you? Uh, it tells you about the relative effect. Here, a odds ratio of 0.83, 17% odds reduction, but a confidence interval that goes from cutting the death in mortality in half to almost doubling mortality. So extremely imprecise. If you move across, you see it's very low quality evidence. Observational studies, not even the right population. Uh, wide confidence intervals. So we're very uncertain about the effect of ribavirin on mortality. Next click. And if you go down, you see there's very low quality evidence for the other outcomes. So in, in both cases, we're really very unsure. And this is most of what we saw in all the treatments we look at, this very low quality evidence. Bottom line, we aren't sure. Next slide. Uh, so this is for the more interesting, I'll show you the more interesting results where it wasn't very low. Most of the time it was just very low. Next click. And what you can see for lopanavir, ritonavir, the combination, it may reduce mortality, still low quality evidence, confidence intervals overlap, no effect, but perhaps some reason to be optimistic. Shortening of length of hospital stay, but unfortunately, moderate quality evidence. In fact, we're more sure of the negative things it does, which include diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Next slide. So this is ARDS. Uh, next click. Here we had evidence from non-COVID patients, but evidence from randomized trials. And this suggested possible benefits and was the only uh, the only condition, or the, sorry, the only treatment for which we made a weak recommendation in favor. Next slide. So all low or very low quality evidence, all weak recommendations, only positive with steroids and ARDS, all the others weak, and uh, they were weak against because uh, we felt, and the patients on the panel told us, that if there was only very low quality evidence of benefit, they would not be interested. Next slide. So we need to be ready for all the randomized trials that are going to appear in the very near future. There are many groups keeping track of randomized trials. Ours is one of them, at least doing what's called a living network meta-analysis, where you look at all the comparisons against all the treatments, the network graph saying, looking at the randomized trials currently available uh, is on this slide. Um, ours, we think, is a special group. Uh, because our living network meta-analyses will inform um, recommendations like the guidelines that we've produced. Uh, and we're working in a collaboration with a group called the Magic Evidence Ecosystem Foundation with the British Medical Journal where these were, are going to be published and in negotiations that we hope to complete successfully with the World Health Organization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Guyot. So we have uh, 16 minutes for questions. Uh, remember in the Q&A section, and I can see we have 10 there already that have been posted. We have 2,000, more than 2,000 people have registered for this webinar. So I apologize in advance, we will not be able to get to all of your questions. We will try and lump some of them together if there are common themes. So if you don't hear the wording of your question specifically, uh, either of those reasons are why. Uh, so I'd like to start with uh, a question for Terry. Terry, you talked during your presentation about two recent updates, even as early as two days ago in, uh, in the two drugs that you were talking about. So in a space where things are changing so rapidly and there's such a demand to understand what the evidence tells us about the use of these drugs, can you talk a little bit about how organizations like Cadeth review um, the speed of change and the different quality of evidence that comes, for example, clinical trials and systematic reviews as high quality evidence, and then some non-traditional sources, things like case reports or preprints, for example. 
That's a, that's a great question, Heather. Uh, I think there's a lot of organizations like ours that are constantly surveying. Uh, Gordon just mentioned his, his group as well. Um, Cadeth is an, is an evidence house. We, we produce and appraise evidence and we try to inform those who are making decisions. So in this period where we're really looking to uh, the evidence to help us make really good decisions, you know, you anchor on, on a, a guiding light that we have, which is um, evidence-based decision-making. We really want to have the evidence at hand to make the best decision. Fortunately, in this time where we really, there's a sparsity of, of evidence, it's really hard to make a good decision. And so you have to make a decision based on best available evidence. So looking to traditional evidence like clinical trials, systematic reviews, I think that's a great start. Uh, a lot of that is, is lacking right now because we're really early in this disease. I mean, this disease has only found its way to humans for less than four months. And so you don't expect to have these great deep RCTs or systematic reviews that you would normally have. And so you start to go to non-traditional sources or things that might be a little bit lower on the, on the evidence scale. Um, I think in situations like this, where there is a huge unmet need, this is something that we have to do. Uh, and we have to do it smartly uh, and we have to be patient. So we have to also wait for this new evidence as it comes. As it matures, we need to constantly be keeping an eye on this new data. Um, I also think that some of the sources that, that you're referring to that are non-traditional, social media, web posting, case reports, um, these play a role as well. They can be really helpful uh, for our group and others to flag potential markers, see trends, and really get ahead of the hype. Uh, so this is really, really uh, helpful for us. And it also can be a, a medium with which we could use to try and disseminate some of the evidence once it becomes available. So it's, a, it's really a, a unique time in that we're using both traditional and non-traditional evidence. And we're really having to work hard to keep up with the speed at which this new evidence is being produced. Great, thank you. And I think that really leads nicely to a question for Dr. Guyat. Uh, Dr. Guyat, you are the godfather or father of evidence-based medicine, certainly in Canada, if not globally, and recognized as that. So tell me a little bit about you know, your thoughts about whether COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic is really going to change our reliance on evidence-based medicine. Um, are clinicians resistant to using things where the evidence is weak? And, and does this open up opportunity to do that? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? What's your perspective as the godfather of evidence-based medicine? Well, if I understand the question, um, what are clinicians inclined to do when there is only low quality evidence? And um, there is a pressure, uh, low quality evidence, we are in a crisis and people are dying in front of the clinicians and the patients are desperate for treatment. Um, and it depends on the culture and it depends on the particular circumstances. So where I reside in Hamilton, uh, Ontario, we have had not much COVID. We were preparing for a big hit. We got a very modest hit. And so the hospitals have had no trouble coping with it and it has not felt in the least overwhelming. In this environment, we did what is one very sensible reaction is our patients have not received any specific antiviral treatment because of the very low quality evidence that I talked about early in my, uh, in my presentation. And that is a perfectly reasonable approach. I talked to colleagues in New York and they said, they were completely overwhelmed. They have th literally thousands of patients. They have very many deaths and they are using the same antiviral treatments that we are rejecting with very low quality evidence. This may be a New York culture versus a Hamilton culture, or it may be that if in Hamilton we had, been, had the same overwhelming uh, hit of the COVID-19 with lots of deaths, maybe we'd be using the untested treatments as well. And this highlights what is actually a fundamental principle of evidence-based medicine, which is evidence never tells you what to do. It's evidence in the context of values and preferences. So you have untested treatments, no clear benefit, almost certainly having some harms, but people are dying. What do you do? Do you give it or you do not give it? There's no right answer. So on the one hand, you say, 
we, as we had in Hamilton, no clear benefits, almost certainly some harms. We need evidence of benefit before we go ahead. On the other hand, another attitude would be, yes, there are harms, but we're desperate for any treatment. If there's any possibility it helps, we're going to give it. So my point being that evidence-based evidence medicine tells you what the evidence, but what, how you act on that evidence depends on context and values and preferences. Thank you. So much a more specific question also for Dr. Guyot. Um, so can you explain in the papers that you've published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, there were a selected group of antivirals that were chosen. So the question that's come in is why would all seltomavir and other antivirals used for H1N1 not have be considered as potential treatments for COVID-19? Can you speak to the selection of antivirals for your papers and then to the broader question about use of other um, untested in COVID situations, uh, but tested and others um, as potential treatments for COVID-19. Okay, so I am an expert in the evidence. I am not an expert in COVID-19 and antiviral drugs. So that's a first um, disclaimer right off the bat. Um, the, um, our, our panel for the CMAJ guideline did involve a whole bunch of experts and I deferred to them. Their reasons for um, choosing the drugs where, so they were experts and they were clinicians um, who uh, at the time we started, COVID-19 was still a Chinese illness. And as a result, the, our frontline clinicians were all Chinese folks. And they chose among the agents where there was some biological reason why, you know, test tube type of reasons why a drug might be successful such as has been offered for hydroxychloroquine, which you heard about, and drugs that clinicians were currently using and that were available. So that was the basis of the choices of the drugs that we used. As to what's going to happen in the future and the basis, um, uh, I'm, my expertise is in processing the evidence. So I'm sitting waiting for the randomized trials and my role is going to be to when the drugs get that far to uh, process the evidence. Thank you. Terry, you mentioned in your presentation the data around remdesivir that was preliminary evidence that had been released reducing mean recovery time from 15 days to 11 days. Uh, the comment, the question that's come in is understanding that may not be statistically significant, um, but in terms of hospital resources and space that isn't then used by hospitalized patients and can accommodate either a return to service and use of ICU and critical care services elsewhere um, and other implications, how do you weigh that particular issue against benefit of number of reduced days? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question from the, from the audience. Uh, and I would agree. I, I, and I didn't want it to come across as, as me saying that that's not important. I think we, we anchored this whole talk around hype and evidence. And I think, um, you know, the silver bullet mentality of do we have a cure? Is this a cure? I, I think the evidence is showing is that this is not a cure. And it's something that's going to help with some of the symptoms and, and help with some of the treatment uh, of COVID-19. So reducing hospital stays by even a few days is monumental when your hospital is flooded and you have lack of resources. And um, you know, that, is a, that is a huge saving. So I don't think that should be discounted. I think it actually should be commended and it's something that more should be invested in and it should be a reason why we use it. I think what needs to be clarified is the risk associated with getting those benefits. Um, and, and understanding what those benefits really mean in the broader scheme of things. So um, I, would, I would agree with the comments coming in, for sure. So I'm not sure, I'm gonna pose this question to both of you, and I don't know if either of you are gonna feel comfortable answering it, but it's something we've had a number of questions come in around, you know, if the evidence around hydrochloroquine is so weak and there are risks that we are now beginning to really uncover and understand, should we continue with clinical trials? When is enough enough? And do we balance our investment in research more where we see promise of evidence or benefit and stop investing in areas where it appears there may not be any benefit? Well, let's start with you, Dr. Guy. Well, um, um, if President Trump agrees, then it might be the time to stop um, the trials of hydroxychloroquine. Um, and I'm not being completely facetious when I say that. So the decision to stop is when 
the community, the relevant community is ready to acknowledge that it's not working. And that has to do with the political environment. So um, it, the hydroxychloroquine has been hyped so much um, uh, and uh, people still seem to believe in it that I think we're going to need definitive evidence to show that it does not work or may even be harmful. In another situation where there had been less hype and uh, the initial results show very little benefit or none, then it might be time to move on much more quickly. So you have to look, you have to look at the political environment in which you are operating and um, the what you don't want is a situation where the trials stop, the evidence is still equivocal, and people are still pushing it because they have an investment in pushing it because people don't like to be wrong. Um, so you wouldn't want that to happen. So I would want the trials in this case to continue until we've really nailed it as to the effectiveness or lack of effectiveness and harm of this particular drug. Thank you. And Terry, as, a, as part of the CADETH organization that reviews uh, drugs with this kind of context, what would be the perspective of the value of ongoing clinical trials? What does it add to the review? Um, so I think the ongoing work, a lot of the, the ongoing work is actually looking at different facets of that broader question. And so if you look at, a, we actually have a, a summary going up today of, of the newer evidence from our original report, since our original report, and you can see that um, there's a table that lo looks at all the variety of combinations of where hydroxychloroquine is now being mixed with other agents or in different configurations or different approaches um, to see how it can benefit. And, you know, I think what's happened in this past week and a half is monumental. So the fact that the World Health Organization has halted a, has this huge study, um, what's happened in Alberta, I mean, it is changing. So I think this change of halting studies takes time. Um, but what's happened in, in a matter of a few days has been, has been pretty great. I, I expect more of this to happen. Uh, of the ongoing trials, I think with the, with the safety signals that we now are seeing, it allows the researchers to have a little bit more foresight and, and, and ability to look for patients that might be at risk and either exclude them from the study or really keep a closer eye on them as they progress to try and see if hydroxychloroquine is truly not useful and potentially harmful or if there is some benefit and a certain subpopulation of interest. And I think that's another point that I would like to raise is, if you look at a lot of the original studies, they actually either excluded or did not pull out certain subpopulations that we now know are of interest, like the elderly. Um, and so here's an example of, if we continue to do work in this area, and we have more insight into the, the drug and some of the side effects, we can now start to tailor who it is that we should be looking at and who is that subpopulation of interest. So, uh, so I'm not disagreeing with uh, Gordon, uh, sorry, I should say the godfather, uh, and I think that, you know, we have to be smart about this, but I think that just halting everything right now might not be the best option. Um, knowledge is power, continue the struggle, find what we can, but now being more aware of what might happen. Okay, thank you. I'm just noting the time. We have two minutes left. And uh, so we do have a long, long list of questions. I apologize. We will not be able to answer all of those, but perhaps as Dr. Guyad and Terry provide their final remarks, uh, some of those in a general way might be answered. So before we go, I'm going to ask Dr. Guyad and, uh, and my colleague Terry if you can offer you know, your, your final comments. What would be your final takeaway message uh, based on the evidence that you've re reviewed? My final takeaway message is there is no treatment available that we can be confident has a major effect, um, but that the, there are lots of randomized trials going on. In the next weeks, we will know a lot more. Thank you. And Terry? Um, I would say, leaving away from this, is that we don't have a silver bullet, just as Gordon has said. I have patience in the process. I think a lot of people are working diligently to produce really good data. Um, and you know, um, this disease has only been around for a few months, so we can't expect to have all of the evidence in front of us. Uh, and just to paraphrase an 80s rap group, Public Enemy, don't believe the hype, right? So validate with evidence. Uh, and I'd probably end off with saying, um, don't go to my mother for scientific advice. <laughs> Thank you. And on that note, thank you very much. Uh, I do want to thank Dr. Hujan and Dr. Guy for their presentations about what the evidence says about antivirals and COVID-19. 
and really very clear and frank answers to the, your questions. Thank you also for those of you who participated in today's talk. We will post this webinar on CADETH's YouTube channel early next week, or you can link to it through our CADETH COVID-19 page, which is covid.cadeth.ca. Um, once the webinar ends, a new window will open with a short evaluation survey for this session, and we really truly would appreciate your feedback. We will be doing more of these and we do want to improve them. Uh, finally, two things. Finally, please join us on June 11th for the second of our COVID-19 webinar series. The topic is addressing psychological trauma due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Can technology help in a time of acute crisis? Uh, and secondly, just please stay tuned on our website. We are posting, if we already haven't, two updates to the hydrochloroquine uh, and chloroquine with or without azithromycin and the remdesivir reports, and we will continue to do so as other information becomes available, as other organizations across Canada and internationally will do. So thank you very much uh, and stay safe. Thank you, everyone.